Thank you, sir. So, good afternoon, everyone. Before uh, proceeding on to case based uh, approach, uh, some uh, historic perspective about the collagen cross linking. Uh, it was Wallen Sock et al. in 2003 when they first time described the collagen cross linking at the Technical University of Dresden, and hence it came to, know, to be known as a Dresden Protocol. So, what happens in this is uh, the cornea is saturated with a ribofibin dye and uh, after uh, saturation of cornea it is exposed to UVA radiation uh, for some duration that increases the uh, collagen cross-linking between the axis and collagen fibrils and this results in strengthening the corneal tissue and also it stops the further progression of corneal ectasias. Now over a period of time the indications for uh, collagen cross-linking has expanded significantly the indications are for ectasias as well as non-ectatic disorders. In ectasias, the primary ectasia such as cradoconus and pedicid marginal degeneration and in secondary uh, ectasia such as post ectasia, ectasias, the collagen cross-linking has been done. For non-ectatic disorders, it has been tried in infectious keratitis, in chemical injuries, in bullous keratopathies, in period marginal degeneration. But uh, in this, we will be talking predominantly about keratoconus. Now, uh, in keratoconus, if corneal thickness is more than 400 micron, in those cases, we proceed ahead with the isoosmolar collagen cross-linking. If the corneal thickness is less than 400, uh, but more than 330 micron, in those cases, we proceed ahead with hypoosmolar collagen cross-linking. Uh, many a times, the collagen cross-linking can be combined with a PRK, uh, that is known as topoguided removal of epithelium in keratoconus, or known as TREC. It can be combined with a PTK where it is known as a cradle protocol. It can, it, uh, it can also be combined with the intracorneal ring segments and also there, uh, the photo activated intrastromal cross linking can be done in cases of uh, as a customized cross linking technique. Uh, so, uh, what are the main parameters or factors that we considered? Corner thickness I have just explained. Uh, similarly, the age. Age is one very important factor because in adults, Ideally, we need to document the progression of keratoconus uh, uh, and if we document the progression, then we should go ahead with the collagen cross-linking. In children, uh, the progression, uh, documentation of progression is not required because in children, the uh, progression is very fast and earlier we go for a collagen cross-linking, the results are better, and, but uh, still there are a uh, higher risk of collagen cross-linking failure in children. In very young children, we should also consider the possibilities of uh, general anesthesia. And a frequent follow-up should be done in children because of more chances of uh, CXL failure. Uh, the third factor, in addition to corneal thickness and age, is the keratoconus progression. Now, how do we determine the keratoconus progression? There are various factors which have been considered. If we uh, see the dressing protocol, in uh, dressing protocol they have taken as increase in K-max value by more than one diopter, patient self-reported deterioration of visual apathy and need for new contact lens fitting more than once in two years. These were the criteria that were taken in the present protocol. Uh, Hirsch et al. in 2011, uh, they considered progression as increase in uh, more than one diopter of this DK, increase of more than one diopter in the manifest cylinder, or increase uh, of 0.5 diopter in manifest spherical, uh, reflective spherical equivalent. But bones and all in 2015, by this time the uh, types of the, uh, shine plug device it had expanded significantly uh, and also the factors, the parameters that are in the different uh, devices, they are different for a uh, particular device. So uh, what they said that there should be consistent change in at least two of the parameters, that is progressive steepening of the interior corneal surface, progressive steepening of the posterior corneal surface and also the progressive thinning as we go from the center towards the periphery. So any two parameters out of these three parameters, then we should consider it as a, uh, that the progression has taken place. They also said that if there is a perceived risk of progression, then uh, also the collagen cross-linking can be done without any need for documentation. So, uh, various protocols are there, whether it's a conventional, accelerated or uh, antiphoresis. <coughs> Although these will be covered in detail by uh, Dr. Namata. Uh, if we see the standard versus accelerated protocol, so various studies have been done, but still uh, the standard protocol or the conventional protocol has been found to be more efficacious compared to accelerated. 
in accelerated protocols, whether it's a 9 milliwatt per, uh, per centimeter square, 18 milliwatt per centimeter square for 5 minutes, or 30 milliwatt per centimeter square for 3 minutes, out of these, the 9 milliwatt per centimeter square for 10 minutes has been found to be more efficacious compared to the other two. So similarly, uh, does uh, supplemental oxygen has a role? This will be covered by Dr. Rajesh Sinhalsen. And also there are uh, two other types. One is the continuous accelerated collagen cross-linking and another is the pulse accelerated cross-linking. In pulse accelerated cross-linking, there is pulsing of the UV radiation is done so that there is sufficient time in the cornea to get oxygenation and they are found to be more efficacious compared to a continuous accelerated collagen cross-linking. Antophoresis, uh, I don't have any first-hand experience. There are very, very few people, I think, in the world or in India doing it. Uh, but uh, here the epithelium is not removed, but it is much more efficacious compared to epion approach because two electrodes are placed in the riboclase. Penetration into stroma is good without removal of the epithelium and then the UV exposure results in a uh, better uh, uh, efficacy compared to epion approach. But still it was found to be inferior to standard Dresden protocol. Uh, some contraindication that you need to be uh, need to keep in uh, mind whenever you are doing uh, collagen cross linking. If there is a prior herpetic ocular infection, in these cases one has to be careful because UV radiation can cause reactivation of the infection. If there is a concurrent ocular infection, that has to be treated first before uh, going ahead with a collagen cross linking. Neurotrophic keratitis, poor epithelial bone healing, and the dry eyes. These should be. Uh, first, the ocular surface should be optimized before going ahead with the collagen cross-linking. Similarly, in pregnancy, one has to be careful and wait uh, uh, for an opportune time uh, for collagen cross-linking. Uh, in uh, many cases, there are very high chances of failure of primary collagen cross-linking. So, uh, what are the risk factors for failure of primary CXL? These are the children, especially if they have allergic conjunctivitis, uh, in uh, history of eye rubbing, uh, female gender, pre-op KMX value of more than 58 and paracentral bone. So they have been found to have higher uh, failure rates compared to normal and in these cases the repeat CXL is required. So let's see few cases. In one eye you can see there is a corneal hydrops, in other eye is carried upon us. So if we see uh, the uh, values in this, uh, the thinnest packy in the left eye is 399 and in the right eye is not reportable due to hydrops. So what should you do? You, you should not wait uh, for any documentation in such cases. You can straight, eye, straight away go ahead with the collagen cross-linking in the left eye. Otherwise it will go, it, it may have the same uh, feature of corneal hydrops. Uh, similarly, uh, this is another case. If the corneal thickness has gone down to the 355. So in these cases also you should not wait for uh, collagen cross-linking. But if the corneal thickness is good, parameters are not very high. Like in this case, in one eye is 550, another is 506. K max value are 49 and 49 by 9. So in these cases you can still wait till you document all the uh, changes and uh, then go ahead. This is another case. In this the right eye, uh, the palm thickness is 428, K max value is 76. In the left eye, the palm thickness is 376 and K max value is 71. So in this case also you should go ahead with the collagen cross link in the left eye, followed by maybe after 2-3 months in the right eye. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, thank you Dr. Vijay for uh, covering it very well. The only question that is always asked, often asked and, and people keep thinking that uh, when should we wait for progression and when not. So as he told that somebody who has already had a high drops, then in that case there is no point waiting. Even on first contact one can go ahead and do a cross thinking. Sometimes uh, it also depends on the age of the patient. Like somebody who is say coming with an uh, advancing keratoconus, something like thickness of 435 at the age of 17 or 18, then uh, you would like to do cross-linking immediately. But somebody who is at the age of 31 coming with 440 and uh, then you may think that let's see, uh, you know, maybe we can wait every three months we can call the patient. So these factors are there. Any, any other situations wherein, you know, you would like to highlight? that uh, we should do immediately uh, or we can wait. I mean, age, I feel, is an important factor. Further, uh, I mean, even if you don't have any documentation, on first report of a patient, because that is that is something which wherein people do have doubt, that patient is coming for the first time. There's no documentation of any progression. 
whether I should do cross-linking or not. That is a big question. Yeah, so in, in the same vein, would you wait um, for, uh, would you do an immediate uh, cross-linking if there is loss of lines uh, in the first visit itself? So I felt that was also an important criteria, especially in a young patient. Absolutely, absolutely ma'am. Very, very important. And uh, uh, another thing, before you decide based on a Delta uh, or any Shamflak image report, you have to uh, ensure that that Shamflak image is, uh, the acquisition quality is good. Sometimes what happens, if the acquisition quality is not good, then you get very, very different parameters. And in those cases, if you take a call on that, it will be, uh, it may not be a correct treatment. So acquisition quality of the image on which you're deciding the treatment has to be good so that you take a correct decision. And in the same vein, when would you repeat, uh, what is the criteria for you to repeat uh, CXL uh, in a patient? So, uh, especially in children, uh, one is we have to follow up frequently. Uh, if they have got allergic disorders or uh, uh, any eye rubbing history, they are likely to uh, have a failure of the primary CXL. So in these cases, the repeat criteria is normally, if there is an increase of K-max value by more than one doctor, increase of uh, cylinder by more than one doctor, and spherical equivalent by more than 0.5 doctor. That is what we are considering at present for uh, repeat CXL. Is, is that release? only for children or for adults as well? Adults also, adults. Uh, uh, there is uh, one group that has also suggested that, you know, uh, if there is some effect, then in order to have an additive effect, like for that is a group, they do repeat CXL even early, like, you know, even uh, three, four months later when they uh, see that there is some effect. If the patient does not show any effect at all, then in that case there is no point repeating because these are some of the outliers which are not going to be affected by cross -linking. And there are some cases which do show some response for, for you know, st stoppage of progression for maybe a couple of years, and then again they started. Then again, there also is a, that is also an indication wherein uh, we should repeat uh, cross linking. Especially after pregnancy, probably. And yes, yes, and post pregnancy, one should definitely keep checking during the pregnancy whether it is changing or not. And if it's changing, we should wait for the delivery of the child and preferably post lactation period so that by that time things stabilize and then again we can uh, go ahead and do it. In children, normally we recommend that every three months we should do the uh, repeat triumphant. In adults, ma'am, uh, six months is I think good enough time. Any, any change, any, any difference? Yeah, I, I think yeah, that, that's the yeah, same criteria. Uh, yes, in, in initial follow-up period, yes, for other reasons also, because sometimes in cross-linking you do get some subepithelial gains. So in initial period, you do have to follow up these patients more frequently to look for the haze. If there is haze, then you have to increase the topical steroid frequency. That is one. And uh, if that is not there, then in that case, after initial, uh, you know, follow-up, epithelial healing, and, you know, uh, then every three months, and then later on six months, and, uh, and if it's stable, then uh, maybe yearly you can follow up the patient. So it, it uh, you know, depends on how the patient is responding and, uh, and duration of I will I'll also give a frequent follow up to a person who is an eye rubber. So usually by three months we get to know whether they want to continue eye rubbing in spite of all that has happened to them. So in that case also. And, and that is something which we have to explain that eye rubbers is, or people who are having these VKCs, the response of CXL in these patients is not good. So the first thing is that if a case of VKC comes to, to us, then we have to first treat VKC to the extent that this child stops rubbing the eye or it is minimal. And then only uh, we can think of doing a cross -thinking. Otherwise, the effect of cross will not be good at all. And secondly, apart from the less effect of cross the risk of subepithelial A is also high in these cases where there is 